Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm Benjamin Ensor. In today's episode, we're asking what's been the biggest story in financial services this year? If 2022 was an ice cream flavour, it'd be fair to say it was a rocky road. Boom. We've seen some of the biggest tests of financial services since the global financial crisis, with uh, global conflicts, economic downturns, industry layoffs, and the long tail effects of the pandemic, all affecting the industry. But it's not all been doom and gloom. Financial services has been stepping up to the plate for a lot of people around the world. And we've seen big progress in inclusion and uh, big developments in many emerging markets of widening access to finance. So for the last FinTech Insider of 2022, we put together a panel of experts to discuss what have been the biggest stories in financial services in 2022? Why did these stories have such an impact? And how will these stories shape 2023? We'll discuss all these and more in today's show. But first, a few brief messages. Don't go anywhere. Here at 11FS, we believe in explaining FS without the BS. That's why we created our 11FS Explore series, videos that break down a complicated financial services topic into something everyone can get their head around, such as non-fungible tokens, buy now, pay later, the cost of living, ESG, circular economies, embedded finance, and inclusive design. Search 11FS Explores on YouTube now. Let's get started. As always, I am joined by a panel of amazing guests who are going to shed some light on this year's events. First of all, I am joined by my colleague, Kate Moody, Global Strategy Director of Customer Experience at 11FS. I hardly need to welcome you back to the show. Um, How would you rate uh, your 2022? Yeah, I enjoyed the Rocky Road pun. Absolutely. I think it's a very good description. I think my 2022, I think, has been probably as mixed as as everyone here has came back to work in early this year after my, my mat leaves, so some time off from the world of fintech, very excited to kind of get back into into the world of fintech. And it's, as you say, been a, a year of ups and ups and downs. So lots of excitement, but also lots of um, stresses and, and difficulties as well. So yeah, very good, very good description and one that I definitely agree with. We have a welcome return to Fintech Insider for Mary Ann Azevedo, Senior Editor at TechCrunch. Welcome back, Mary Ann. Has it been a good year to be a journalist at TechCrunch? Well, I would say it's been it's been a very interesting year to be a tech tech journalist in general, especially covering the world of fintech. Um, there's been so much going on, and I actually feel it was a very important year to be a journalist because it really it really um, forced us to go beyond all the flashy fundraising and high valuations to dig deeper into what's really going on behind the scenes at a lot of these startups. So I I think um, it's been it's been a great learning experience actually. It's also been one of those years where journalists around the world have been shining light into dark corners, sometimes, you know, at risk of their lives, not so much in fintech, obviously, but uh, <laughs> it's been one of those years that reminds you of just the important, crucial role played by by journalists. Um, so I'm also delighted on, on a very similar note uh, to welcome back Alex Johnson, creator of Fintech Takes. Welcome back, Alex. A pleasure to have you here too. How was your 2022? It was good. It was good. It was um, very much following everything Marianne writes and trying to make sense of everything happening in fintech. So it was a busy year, but um, lots of exciting stuff, lots of great stuff to talk about. All right. Well, let's dive into some of that uh, exciting stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by rewinding the clock back to March, which is when, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the West imposed a series of sanctions to sever the Russian economy from much of the rest of the world, which was obviously widely reported, but this particular story we picked up from the Wall Street Journal. So as most of you will remember, Western nations dropped economic sanctions of a historic scale on Russia, hobbling its financial system and effectively reversing 30 years of post-Cold War engagement. The European Union, the United States and their allies agreed to cut off a number of Russian banks from the main international payment system, SWIFT, SWIFT, or the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, is a secure messaging system for large cross-border payments, enabling international trade. The response to the invasion of Ukraine reverberated through Russia's economy, which has largely been cut off from much of the Western world. It also hindered the ability of Russia's central bank to manage the country's financial system and mitigate the damage. 
Western banks and businesses, including Visa, MasterCard, H&M and Apple, added to their government's actions by halting their own operations in Russia and sales to Russian companies. Removal from SWIFT is deemed to be a severe curb because almost all banks use the system for international transfers. So, Kate, I'm going to come to you first. Have these sanctions worked? Well, I'm definitely not a foreign policy expert, but I think, you know, I think most people would say that by most measures um, of success that the Russian war is is failing, that they have not achieved the the outcomes that they were aiming for. And I think a large part of that has been due to the financial pressures that these reg, um, these uh, restrictions have have put on the Russian state. Um, so we've seen huge economic challenges in Russia, but also throughout the whole rest of Europe and the wider world. So um, I think definitely the sanctions have contributed to reducing the success of the Russian campaign. Have we seen the war in Ukraine end as of the time of recording? Not, sadly, um, but it's definitely reduced its its success, but had huge repercussions through the rest of the world that we're still you know, understanding the impact of and are likely to reverberate for, for months to come. Alex, what's, what's your sense of this without without diving into politics, which is hard to avoid a, on a topic like this? There, you know, people being calling for more severe sanctions, people being calling for, you know, fewer sanctions. Do you think the sort of financial services industry has sort of do you think if they've used appropriate financial sanctions? Do you, have you seen any sort of gaps or obvious weaknesses in this in this approach? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the takeaways that I had from it was just uh, shining a spotlight on AML, which is a topic that we obviously talk a lot about in fintech and in financial services. Like, this is why we have AML restrictions, right, is for things like this. I mean, obviously, you want to curb bad behavior or criminal behavior all the time. But when there's something like this, that's a real pressure test for the system. This is why we have AML. This is why we have the ability to update sanctions. And I think for the most part, you know, going off what Kate said, it has been pretty effective. I haven't seen a ton of gaps. I, I do remember a lot of commentary at the time talking about crypto as maybe a sort of off ramp or way to get around sanctions. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting discussion, actually, because it just sort of pointed out the limitations for crypto or really any other solution for, for circumventing sanctions, right? I mean, there really aren't a lot of ways to get around it because at the end of the day, you have to have off-ramps and you have to have on-ramps, and all of those are subject to uh, AML. And thus, I think the sanctions pretty much across the board were pretty effective. I suppose one of the risks of this in a sense, I mean, risk isn't really the right word, one of the potential downsides of, of this for, for Western countries is that it could result in Russia and China and other countries just simply building alternatives. Marianne, do you think that's something realistic? Have you seen any sign of that happening? Do you think countries like Russia and China and other maybe you know, dictatorships or, or non-democracies may simply try and set up a sort of parallel universe of financial systems? I mean, they could certainly try. Uh, I'm not sure how effective that would be in terms of, of actually ad adoption and usage over time. I think it would be very, very difficult to build something that would rival current or existing infrastructure that that would be used. So I, I'm a little skeptical. I think that I'm not saying the efforts wouldn't be there, but would they actually be effective and have the outcome that the countries would desire? I'm not sure about that. Let's move to to the sort of more human side of of the the crisis. So the you know the Russian invasion obviously forced um, millions of Ukrainians away from their homes. You know, and obviously there are people in other elsewhere in the world also affected by by wars um, who, who are being forced to flee flee their homelands. But we also saw an outpouring of support from people across Europe and around the world for for Ukrainians, particularly in countries like Poland, obviously, you know, neighbouring countries. Um, and a number of fintechs stepped forward and tried to help or did directly help. Um, Kate, what were some of your, what, what did you see happening? What did you like um, from the response from fintechs? 
Yeah, I think we saw a lot of, as you say, very positive initiatives. Um, I think the likes of Bunk and Zopa and Monet's were very quick to kind of come out and and provide opportunities for their customers to, to donate, to contribute financially. I think there was also help provided with visas, making payments and employment opportunities, helping to help those who were displaced to, to find jobs and things like that. So um, I think we did see a lot of practical help being being offered, whether it kind of went as far as it could have done to make it easier for those people is is another question you know so my my neighbors actually had some had a ukrainian couple who were staying with them they sort of took them in and i think they were talking through some of the difficulties they had experienced having their life move from one country to another and there are all sorts of problems in the financial system that we still need to fix i think you know moving your financial life from one place to another is difficult in the best of circumstances in the rush and chaos of of conflict is even harder so i think you know credit scoring in particular is an area that we really do need to drive further innovation in particularly going to 2023 we've seen some interesting stuff around you know what nova credit for example are doing in the us but i'd love to see that that growing and expanding so that people can move from country to country financially in, in a more seamless way Obviously, we, Alex, I'm going to throw this next question to you, but I mean, obviously, we all would like to see the war end. Um, well, maybe not Putin, but pretty much everyone else wants to see the war end. What, what would you like to see sort of next year? So assuming the war continues, and there's this sort of danger, maybe of, of fatigue from other countries, because, you know, as it slips away from the headlines, perhaps people start to forget that, you know, that this war continues. Um, is there anything you'd like to see from fintechs or, you know, building on sort of some of Kate's points, anything more you think um, maybe the fintech community could or should be trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, you see this a lot, sort of maybe best exemplified on Twitter, where it's like everyone gets outraged about something and then we move on to the next thing. And obviously this is one of those things that we absolutely cannot do that on. We have to continue to be focused on Ukraine and the the war and just bringing attention to it. I think just keeping awareness of it up that this is an ongoing problem and isn't going away and it hasn't stopped is really, really important. Um, you know, as it relates to what fintech companies can do in particular, I think building off of Kate's point, you know, as we start to think about how do we build a, a global financial services ecosystem where people can move seamlessly from one country to the other and your credit history can follow you and it's easy to transfer bank accounts. The more we build out that infrastructure, you know, and, and Nova Credit's a good example of this, I'd love to see as much of that focused on Europe and Eastern Europe as possible. Like if you're thinking about, hey, you know, we want to trial this new technology, we have this new solution that we think could be effective for solving this problem, start in the area where it's needed most, right? We can always put it out in other countries over time, but I think the more we can focus fintech innovation on helping those that have been displaced or affected by this war, you know, the better we will we'll be off. Yeah, love that. Great point. Okay, well, let's move on to our next story. Um, now, this story in and of itself wasn't necessarily the biggest story of the year, but it um, was a precursor to a whole series of other stories. So this next story is about Fast, which shut its doors after slow growth. Now, I believe this story comes from TechCrunch. So I think it was actually written by Marianne. So I'm going to summarise what Marianne wrote <laughs> and then throw to you for, for comment. So um, Fast, which is a startup or was a startup that provided online checkout products, announced it was shutting down. The company's future had been in doubt after uh, reports indicated that its 2021 revenue growth was modest, its cash burn was high, and its fundraising options were limited. In a statement, the company said that in the wake of making great strides on our mission of making buying and selling frictionless for everyone, we have made the difficult decision to close our doors. The company, which was founded by Dom Holland and Alison Barr Allen, went on to describe itself as a trailblazer, saying that not all such parties make it to the mountaintop. They claimed that while it failed, the startup managed to forever change the world of online commerce. So, <laughs> uh, Marianne, did it forever change the world of uh, online commerce? And was it a trailblazer in the way that they'd like to claim, or was it a trailblazer in other ways? Well, um, yeah, I, I can't say that it forever changed the world of uh, one-click online commerce. Uh, I would say it was certainly, it was the biggest, like it was the first big shock story of the year in a year that ended up, that we ended up seeing many more shock stories. So, um, and I guess in a sense, it was a trailblazer from from that perspective. Um but yeah, I think it was it was shocking at the time, and I think a lot of a lot of that had to do with the hype surrounding the company 
that one of its co-founders, Dom Holland, really had a large role in, in playing to to set up, you know, just just quite a lot of hype. And so it was it was a big high that we saw crash. I can't let the hype around founders comment go with, <laughs> without picking up on that, because obviously we've had a couple of other examples of that. Subsequently, most obviously FTX. Alex, um, do you think we as an industry have gone too far in lionizing, I hesitate to say celebrity founders, charismatic uh, founders? I absolutely do. Yes. I mean, I, I think going to your point about FTX, that um, uh, epic novel that was written by Sequoia about uh, Sam Bankman Fried that was on their website until they quietly took it off, although it, it lives on in the Wayback Machine for those who want to go back and read it. I mean, it's it's embarrassing, honestly. And um, I it, it's only embarrassing when the tide goes out and you see that obviously there was a lot of fraud and uh, just bad behavior happening. But it, it, it was, I think, a really good indication of before all of this happened, that was totally normal. And that was something that uh, VC companies would do for their portfolio companies and their founders. It was a way that they would sort of justify their investments uh, in these companies was to say, yeah, they might have a little bit of challenge figuring out exactly how to grow or what the company is. Going back to fast, I still don't really know what one-click checkout even is. Like if you ask me to define specifically what it is, I'm not 100% sure. I know the sort of general idea, but um, the product itself, I could never even quite nail down. But boy, Dom seems really energetic on Twitter. And, you know, he has these cool sweatshirts and they're sponsoring lots of fun stuff. And so they must be making progress and I'm sure they'll figure it out. And I think that sort of confidence in the founder over everything else and lionizing them based on that confidence, that's the thing that really seems to have washed away in 2022. And I think that's for the best, honestly. One click checkout is when things arrive the following morning after you were browsing the internet while drunk the previous <laughs> evening. <laughs> well, drunk or looking after a small human, Benjamin. I've done a lot of online shopping <laughs> yes, in the yes. early hours of the morning. So there's, there, can be, there can be lots of reasons for it. But I suppose just to follow on from Alex's point, I think it's been really interesting to see in some of the fundraisers that have happened this year, um, in Marianne, I was just reading uh, shortly, you know, a, a moment before recording, actually, the, the story you wrote about Stories Fundraise in Mexico. Um, and I thought it was particularly interesting how much the, the VCs kind of backing them talked about the experience of the team and, and their sort of track record in sort of incumbent financial services institutions. So I think that has been also a theme of this year that we're starting to see those those fundraisers focus more on the sort of traditional financial services credentials of the founding team. And I think that's been really interesting to see play out. Well, I, I don't know how many people know that Dom Holland had started a company in uh, Australia. It was um, described as the Uber of towing and it pretty much failed miserably. And so there was... <laughs> There was a lot of negative um, publicity around that as well. So I, I can't say his track record was stellar to begin with, but uh, that apparently was was overlooked in the case. And fast, they raised, what, over $124 million, were valued at nearly $600 million. And then it turns out that for 2021, they had um, put six figures in revenue that was hardly very impressive, especially for for all the money that they'd raised and, and all the enthusiasm and hype around the company. So is this actually almost a welcome correction in the sense that maybe in 2020, 2021, 2019, there were companies that were getting probably more funding than they should have done because there was a lot of cheap capital chasing after opportunities, some of which were maybe not very good. Um, Alex, have we, is this sort of is this a is a is this a needed correction in funding for fintech? Yeah, I absolutely think it is. I mean, I think that in particular the later stage rounds that got to be pretty psychotic are the ones that are getting adjusted right now. I mean, you'd see these, you know, $100 million Series C, $150 million Series D, uh, which were the ones that were pushing these companies over that $1 billion valuation threshold. And you know, you could tell by the companies that were making these investments, right? It's a lot of the the soft banks and tigers of the world that don't really specialize in fintech, but specialize in writing really big checks really fast in a very founder friendly way. And 
they really came into the space and and blew up a lot of stuff. I mean, I think, you know, the one example I go back to continuously is Klarna, which is a very old company that's been around for a very long time and has been building a very strong business slowly in Europe. And it wasn't really until 2018, 2019, that uh, buy now, pay later as a term kind of took off. And uh, suddenly VCs couldn't wait to just pour as much money into buy now, pay later as possible. And I think Klarna, while it benefited in the short term from all of that interest might, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, want a do-over on some of that funding because it really pushed them to grow much faster and much uh, more loosely than they otherwise would have just because that was the instruction they got from their investors. So you you mentioned Klarna there, and that leads not neatly into one of the other sort of stories of the year, which is the sort of growing number of layoffs at big fintechs and, and smaller fintechs like Klarna, like Stripe and so on, um, and obviously some big tech companies like um you know, Twitter and so on. Marianne, a, a, a lot of people, you know, good, hardworking people end up as casualties of some of these sort of aggressive funding rounds, casualties of these sort of, uh, these charismatic CEOs who haven't actually got very good plans and so on. You know, there are thousands of uh, workers who've been laid off by some of these tech companies. What what sort of, what happens to them? I mean, you know, where do the where do these people go? Um, do they leave the industry? Do they find other jobs? What do you have a perspective on what happens to some of the the, the, the people who get caught up in these um, over aggressive companies? Well, first of all, I would have to say um, it's been it's been kind of astounding uh, as a as a journalist in the space seeing these companies that were actually deca corns in 2021. Uh, valuations like 95 billion, 13 billion, 12 billion. And these are the ones that are having the mass layoffs this year, right? These are the the headlines we're seeing. And you have to wonder, okay, well, what was going on here? Were they just overly optimistic? Did they not see a downturn coming? Short-sightedness, you know, what's going on? Um, every case was probably different. Unfortunately, yes, the, the employees are now paying the price for this aggressive overhiring. I think it depends on really the experience level of some of these workers. I know one who's brilliant, who's still struggling maybe six months after losing his job to figure out what he's going to do next. Um, I've seen those who have experience at other startups who've decided they want to try their own hands at, at their start, their own startups, founding their own companies. Of course, um, this is a not exactly maybe the the best time to be starting a fintech, but then again, I'm also seeing a lot of seed raises, so maybe not. Um, and I think a lot, some people are just turned off of startups altogether. To be honest, they're they're looking at um, different different industries outside of fintech. They're looking at bigger companies that might offer a little more stability. Uh, I think startups are are awesome because they represent hope. They can be very exciting. But when you're the, the victim of a mass layoff, especially those who've been laid off more than once, you can feel quite burned by it. And you might might actually yearn for something that might be a little, little more boring, but uh, uh, feel a little bit more secure. Yeah, it's... Um... It's brutal, isn't it? It's and and it really knocks people's self confidence. You know, even even if you know there there are thousands of other people who let go at the same time, it really hits hits individuals really hard. I think some some sort of founders and executives take their responsibility to their employees much more seriously than others. Some are really conscious that they're carrying other people's hopes with them, and others just see them as sort of tools, you know, on the way to you know personal greatness. I've seen some very optimistic LinkedIn posts from people who work at incumbent banks. They've been like, come and work at, you know, insert name of X, very traditional uh, institution. And part of me thinks, God, that would be so, so difficult for those people. But then you half hope, positive side of your brain hopes, you know, maybe if you could take some of the talent from Stripe and put it into the traditional financial services space, like maybe we could see some real change because that, that would be awesome. It'd be amazing. All right. We'll just take a quick pause here and we will be back very shortly and then pick up our next story. Embedded banking and banking as a service business models open up a world of opportunities for banks, but they also present plenty of challenges along the way. In our latest report, in partnership with Infosys Finical, we unpack the growth and revenue opportunities for banks, take a look at the brands that are already making headway by embedding banking into the context of customer journeys, and address the challenges that banks and brands need to overcome to deliver embedded banking successfully. Find out more and download your copy at content.11fs.com. 
Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider. Blockchain Insider. 11FS Spotlight. 11FS Explores. Open mic night. After dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Okay, let's now move on to our final big story um, to round up 2022. And so this story comes from September, uh, which was reported in the New York Times. It was reported in The Big Issue uh, in the UK about shoppers relying on buy now, pay later and microloans for groceries in markets like uh, the UK and the US. So as inflation has mounted, uh, Americans are increasingly turning to buy now, pay later providers to finance what they eat. Food accounted for about 6% of buy now, pay later purchases in the United States in 2021. And in the past year, um, BNPL player Zip has seen 95% growth in US grocery purchases and 64% growth in restaurant transactions. Klarna, meanwhile, reports that more than half of the top 100 items its app users are buying are grocery and household items. Zilch says groceries and dining out account for 38% of its transactions. Meanwhile, in the UK, around 50,000 people applied for microloans from supermarket Iceland in the f- its first week of its launch. The Iceland Food Club has been made available across the UK with people able to apply for loans of between £25 and £100 to pay for groceries in the supermarket's stores. Customers are able to pay back £10 per week under the scheme, which Iceland Foods Managing Director Richard Walker says was intended to tackle food insecurity. Kate, obviously people worldwide are being hit by rising costs of living driven by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and other factors. Is buy now, pay later part of the answer? Or does that just make the problem worse? I mean, I think for for some people, inevitably, buy now, pay later will be a positive tool that can help them to make sensible financial decisions. Um, But yeah, this story just makes me really angry and sad. You know, like when I open my Deliveroo app, which I do far too often, and see Klarna at the bottom, it, it just makes me cross. Like, I think these are irresponsible checkout decisions that these companies are giving people. Um, and we know that with the increasing prevalence of buy now, pay later, not just, you know, Klarna, but all of the other providers as well, you know, sometimes you see checkouts with multiple different buy now pay later options all sort of stacked one on top of the other i think the main concern i have you know i've i've done research with people that have debt and one of the main issues that people talk about is how easy it is or how easy it was even before buy now pay later became a thing to have debt in so many different places that you can't easily keep track of you, know, you can't tell how much you owe to which people in which time frames at which interest rates which should you prioritize which should you pay off first what impact is that having on your credit score what impact is that going to have on the financial decisions that you can make further down the line um yeah this this story just really 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 concerns me and i think by now pay later is is definitely an improvement on the sort of historical credit card industry with its exorbitant interest rates for sure but does that mean it's a perfect tool in its current status absolutely not alex are we are we just watching another sort of financial mis-selling crisis in the making? Are people going to look back at this and say, why weren't the regulators quicker to shut this down? How was this allowed to happen? Or is this a cool, useful, flexible tool and actually it's up to adults to decide how to spend their money? You know, I think I fall more on the side of the spectrum of um, this is something regulators need to get their hands around quicker rather than uh, slower. I mean, Anytime you innovate around credit or lending, there's just a huge potential for consumer harm. And, you know, I know for a fact that a lot of the initial sort of product design and sort of the way the product was structured in Buy Now, Pay Later was designed to sort of make it seem more like a payment tool and not a credit tool, right? And so if you look at like, you know, paying for Buy Now, Pay Later, where you split the payment up into four, you pay the first 25% right up front, and then the three remaining payments over two-week increments 
That was designed partially to get around, at least in the U.S., some of the laws that define what an installment loan looks like, right? And so they're trying to present it as a type of payment rather than a type of loan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, regulators will catch up to that. They'll figure it out. The CFPB has already come out and said, you know, this is our view on buy now, pay later. It does have some positives, but we have some concerns, including this ability to sort of disguise it as payments. My concern is more how that sort of misrepresentation impacts the way that consumers think about the product, right? Because, um, you know, for all of us, we've, you know, had credit cards and other types of loans for a while. Like, we understand how these products work. But if you think about a 19-year-old who's never had any credit at all, their first exposure to credit is this buy now, pay later box that's in the app that they're shopping in or is online when they're checking out. And it says pay in four. It doesn't say credit. You don't need to have a credit file in order to get one. You don't need to have a credit score. Uh, Your payment or not uh, doesn't get reported to the credit bureaus at the moment. And so there's a whole bunch of things that I think were potentially teaching badly to younger consumers around buy now, pay later, uh, because it is credit and we should be teaching that appropriately. And so I don't necessarily think uh, in the abstract, it's a bad tool, but the way that it's been implemented and the way that it's been sort of disguised as a payment rather than a loan is, I think, going to have some long-term negative consequences. Do you agree, Marianne? Um, And and does it matter what people are paying for with it as well? Yes. I mean, I've been watching the space for a while and actually was I, I'm kind of with Kate. I was a little bit horrified to to read this and learn this. Um, I didn't even realize that this had become the case. I know that buy now, pay later has become um, very mainstream and ubiquitous. It's it's everywhere. Um, but it, you know, at first it was kind of more for these luxury purchases. You know, your Pelotons, things like that. Now that it's like trickled down into to groceries, it does worry me quite a lot. Um, I think that uh, Alex's point of, about people not really understanding, not just younger consumers. Consumers, but consumers in general, not quite, they're not really, they haven't been educated on what buy now, pay later is. They look at it, oh, there's an easy way to, to pay for, for this, easy way to pay for that. They can very easily get in over their heads, find themselves in, in serious debt. Um, and because they don't, they don't view it as credit, the, they're not really being as careful, actually. In fact, they're probably being less careful than they would be if they were paying with a credit card. So I I think there's a lot of things to be concerned about. I I do think it can be useful, it can be helpful, but 100% there needs to be more education around it, more regulation around it. Well said. Kate, should we flip this around? Because it's it's easy for the four of us to sort of sit here and and say, hey, this is is bad, and it is bad. Um, and, And it's if it's getting people into more debt, that's obviously not good at all. But if we turn it around, what what could and should fintech companies and established financial services companies be doing to try and help customers with the cost of living crisis? Have you seen some positive things that, that firms can do? Or are yeah, doing? absolutely. And I suppose, you know, even with it by now, pay later, you can definitely see positive use cases. So we know huge amounts of data shows that people with lower incomes face poverty premiums because they're not able to access you know, the cheaper prices of buying things either sort of outright or in bulk. So I can definitely see how with the right kinds of journeys, and as Alex and Marianne have sort of talked about, if, if these products are positioned and explained in the right way, then there are definitely ways that using credit can help people on low incomes to actually save money because they are able to access products um, more efficiently. But we've seen all sorts of other innovations in, in fintech as well. I think I posted on LinkedIn recently, I love what the US Fintech Dave has done by integrating their sort of side hustles discovery feature into their app, like actually helping people to increase their income um, in a way that is customised to them and their circumstance and the location, I think is awesome. Um, and we've also seen some apps start to do some really cool stuff around helping people to really actively reduce their spend. Um, so obviously I think you know, Snoop is one of the examples in the UK that we always look at. And they do some really great analytics work to help people understand where they could reduce, reduce their bills, where they could find vouchers and savings. So there's all sorts of great things out there. Um I am starting to get a bit annoyed at my Monzo account for just telling me that I'm spending more this month for not really telling me what to do about it. I think that kind of observational insight is just quite frustrating at the moment. And I think it's those fintechs that are going the next step on to actually help people make choices or take action. Those are the ones that I think are going to make a real difference. Yeah, love it. Alex, a quick throwback question to you. Uh, you, you. You made that point about regulation. It's easy with hindsight. Um 
Do you think the regulators in, in different countries should have moved faster? Is, is, do you think that was a massive misstep from the regulators? Yeah, I do think they should have moved faster. I mean, I think that one of the things that we sort of discount in terms of how fast these different things can move within fintech and financial services is the impact of the larger macroeconomic environment, right? And so um, I think buy now, pay later surged over the last couple of years because we were in a low rate environment, right? And it was really inexpensive for companies to borrow money and then lend that money to consumers. It was really inexpensive for consumers to borrow. And we were in sort of a consumption on mode, right? And it it does honestly bum me out that uh, a lot of the regulations around buy now, pay later are just kind of getting put in place now or thought about mm. now as we're in a high rate environment. And I think buy now, pay later lenders are taking their foot off the gas. Like we missed the window to really address the problem and help prevent consumer harm. And so I do think that when we're approaching this from a regulatory perspective, I know there's a process. I know there are timelines. I know you can't do things overnight, but recognizing the larger sort of market incentives that are driving this behavior, I think is incredibly important for having timely regulation that actually helps. Well said. Okay, that's a lot of turbulence for one show. So we're going to move on and try and end on a high note uh, to take us out. Um, So we're going to ask all of you, including me, what has made you feel good about uh, financial services this year? Kate, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, it's actually... Lots of things to choose from here. There is a lot of positivity out there. I think something that I have particularly enjoyed seeing this year has been some of the rebalancing of sort of VC money. You know, obviously we've seen difficult fundraising environments in in sort of the Western markets, but I've loved seeing Latam fintech in particular be be more in the spotlight. Marianne, I know you've been covering this, and I've, I've loved reading kind of your coverage of it. So, um, you know, we saw New Bank turning a profit in Brazil. Um, as I mentioned earlier on the show, you know, I thought it was great to see Story in Mexico. Um, having that that great fundraising round, you know, they've they've seen huge growth, and these are countries that um, have you know, customers in those in these countries have been hideously underserved by traditional banks for for so so long. Have you know, histories of great sort of financial uncertainty that every time I speak to customers in those regions, it makes me realise how. Um, how ungrateful I am for the stability that I've experienced in my own life. Um, so I really believe that fintech can have a huge and is having a huge impact in giving customers in those markets more choice uh, and more visibility and clarity on, on their financial lives. And that to me is really, really exciting that you know, money is maybe starting to go out of, out of some of those established markets and moving more towards developing markets and um I've spent some time in Latam, so maybe I'm a bit bit biased towards it, but um, I'm loving seeing that that growth and, and that excitement there. I love it, Marianne. What 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 positive story really caught your eye in 2022? Yeah, I would have to say when you when we say story, I would think maybe trend is is a a better word. Um, I am not a fan of the way uh, the credit score is determined, you know, here in the U.S. So I'm I'm really it's just, I mean what decades old. I don't know. This, this is just something that was decided upon so long ago that just doesn't make sense anymore, right? The, the criteria that a person's credit score is based on. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by different companies offering credit um, on different things like cash flow and income, as opposed to just you know your credit score. I'm also, I mean, not as opposed, yeah, not just uh, your credit score. I'm also encouraged by things like. People earning, uh, if we're going to have this this antiquated model, people getting points for doing things like paying rent on time or um, paying for subscriptions uh, every month on time, like even things like Netflix, I wrote about one company where you can actually build your credit, you can earn, I guess, earn points um, toward your credit score, essentially, by doing things that a lot of people do all the time, but they don't really get any positive consequences out of them, you know, paying rent, paying for subscriptions. So that that kind of that kind of thing is encouraging to me because I do I agree. And I agree with you, Kate. Um, my husband's Brazilian and I and it's absolutely disgusting, like the the interest rates that people have to pay in Latin America. And it's like those who who can least afford it are the ones that are having to to pay these awful rates and have very little access to to financial uh, products that others have. So anyway, I get get a little heated on the topic, but I I just think opening up access in these different ways, giving people options and not, not, you know, having a credit, the definition of a credit score 
change and evolve is encouraging to me. Yeah, I, the uh, the U.S. credit rating system is outdated. It's based on ideas that made sense, you know, when it was designed 40 or 50 years ago, but just no longer make any sense. So completely agree. Alex, what trend <laughs> or story um, <laughs> made you feel most positive about the industry in 2022? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick out a trend as well. I, I think that for me, it's... Um, the stubbornness of early stage fintech founders that are building in categories that VCs don't like, right? So there's, I think, a, a general trend, which makes sense, which is that um, if you're going to start a fintech company, pick out a trend or an area within fintech that VCs love. It'll be easy to get funding. You can say, oh, we're going to be plaid for X or stripe for Y or whatever. And you get a big check and off you go. That's what a lot of people do, but there is a subset of founders that I really like um, who intentionally go into those pitch meetings and go, we want to do personal financial management. And like any VC that's invested in fintech for a while thinks personal financial management is horrible. They probably have had a, a product or an app that they backed in the past that didn't work. But the founder's perspective on PFM is, look, this is still a problem that's unsolved, right? We, we need to fix this problem. Clearly, people don't have a good grasp on how to manage their money. They tell us in every survey that they want be help better managing their funds. And maybe we just haven't cracked the code yet on the technology, the interface, the way to interact with consumers to help them better do this. Maybe we don't need just one PFM app in the market. Maybe we need 100 for all the different segments of consumers and the different ways they think about their money. But you can tell when you talk to these founders that they're just sort of personally obsessed with solving the problem and they're not going to let it go and they're not going to get dissuaded by you know doing 100 pitch meetings with VCs and not getting anywhere they're just going to keep going and i think those kinds of companies and those kinds of founders first they give me a lot of optimism that there's still a lot in fintech that's problem focused and customer focused not just focused on the latest hottest trend and it also i think bodes well for the next couple years in fintech because I think as Marianne and Kate both alluded to, this industry is not going to be for tourists for the next couple of years. It's not going to be very friendly to people who just want to pop in and grow a company and then get a quick exit. You're going to have to be stubborn and stick things out for a while. And I think that mindset is going to really thrive over the next couple of years. So that's what gives me hope. Yeah, I love it. I love the passion and determination of, 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 of founders who are truly focused on an unserved customer problem. Yeah. Benjamin, what about you? For me, I think it's probably the emergence and growing strength of fintech for good. There are so many, mostly small fintechs around the world that are trying to make the planet a better place um, by supporting the circular economy, by helping people reduce their carbon footprints, by finding ways to try and tackle the climate crisis um, and stop the destruction of the planet. So there's all sorts of them like Stilt in the States, Twig in the UK, Fairlow in Sweden, Omicom in Sweden, uh, Kogo in the UK, um, Bima Insurance right across Africa and Asia, Lendwise, um, Twig, um, Shoal, etc. There's dozens of these fintechs for good. Um, and then you've also got organizations like the, um, the World Food Program, you know, delivering cash to um, poor women um, right across the world to try and help them get out of poverty. So it's, to me, it's all of those fintechs that are enabling people, particularly people who are struggling to live better lives and helping all of us to reduce the harm we're doing to the planet. Those are the ones that inspire me and make me feel positive that there's going to be a future here for my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. I didn't have them yet, but um, but th there will be a future for this planet. That To me, that's the positive hope. I was just going to say, yeah, you were telling me the other day your son's just gone to university. I was thinking, wow, steady on there, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to wrap up with a quick fire final question. What 2022 buzzword would you love to ban going into 2023? And I can see from your faces that maybe you haven't all thought this through yet. Um, who's going to go first? Has anyone got a buzzword they'd like to ban? Well, I've thought about it. I just, I'm not cool enough to know any of the buzzwords. I think that's my, my main issue. But um, I suppose one phrase that I just I've heard a lot as we've been talking about is redundancies and layoffs is you know, capital efficiency and I it's, I don't think it's a buzzword but I think it is a phrase that lots of companies are using to kind of condense very complex 
decisions and trade-offs into something pithy in a in a press release. So if this trend towards uh, redundancies continues into the new year, which I hope it doesn't, then I hope that we'll get to understand more of the trade-offs that these these companies are making when they're making these very difficult decisions. I think it glosses over quite a lot of nuanced decision making in a way that I don't feel is is as transparent as it should be. Alex and Marianne, do either of you have a buzzword that you see your competitors using that, <laughs> that uh, you, you you avoid? I would love to kill Web3 until it's dead and then bury it. Uh, I mean, I I think there are really cool things being built in, uh, in and around the crypto ecosystem, but I think Web3 is very much synonymous with what we were talking about before, where we start to lionize these concepts and they get divorced from reality. And uh, my hope is that that particular term gets washed out because I, I read it way too much last year. Uh, Marianne? Mine might sound kind of silly, but actually buzzy. Buzzy gets to me because I feel like the buzzier a startup is, the less likely it is to be very successful, to be honest with you in some cases, because I'm really I'm really drawn to the the lower key startups, right? The ones who don't feel like they have to to like tweet how awesome they are every week and how amazing they're doing and how much better they are than their competitors. Like I I like the the companies that are just sort of under the radar, like one I interviewed recently, didn't even raise at all in 2021. And they're like, they've got a revenue run rate of 36 million this year. You know, I I just, I want to see more of these kinds of companies that are quietly building. So buzzy, all of that. Mm. Fair enough. I think I think if I had to get rid of one, maybe I'd try and get rid of Metaverse because yes. we lose sight of the fact it's actually real people, you know, interacting with other real people. Um, and if you don't know who the person is, maybe it's a Russian bot. Anyway, so mine would probably be Metaverse. But would agree with you 100% there, actually. <laughs> okay, well, that wraps up today's discussion. Thank you so much uh, for joining and sharing your perspectives on the year. Where can people find out a little bit more about you and your companies? Uh, Let's start with you, Alex. Uh, Yeah, my newsletter is called Fintech Takes. So just Google Fintech Takes and you will find it. Uh, And I'm also on Twitter, Alex H underscore Johnson. And Mary Ann? TechCrunch.com. I have a newsletter called The Interchange. If you go to the newsletter section on the site, you could subscribe to it. I'm also on Twitter at Bay Area Writer. And Kate? Yeah, I'm on um, LinkedIn, Kate Moody on LinkedIn or on Twitter at K8Moody. And as for me, Benjamin, you can find me on LinkedIn, Benjamin Ensor, or at 11fs.com. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, If you like what you've heard, uh, please do subscribe. uh, Let us know what you think. Um, If you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. uh, Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider uh, or email us at podcast at 11FS.com. Thank you all so much. Goodbye. And we look forward to talking to you again in 2023. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye.